morning and aloha. My name is Mark Schlaff. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. Uh, the title of our program today is War and Peace in Vietnam, Choices and Consequences. My guest is Chuck Crumpton. Chuck is a friend of mine and an attorney who prefers to think of himself as an arbiter and a mediator, which may have something to do with his topic today. Uh, Chuck and I have had prior programs discussing Vietnam, its history, its present, and its future, and I think we could probably talk forever uh, over uh, drinks in a jazz bar in uh, Ho Chi Minh City uh, at some point. But we could talk a lot about Vietnam, what it's gone through. Uh, Chuck first went to Vietnam as a postgraduate student in the 60s and has returned many times since then. Uh, that experience has been defining for him. Uh, today's program will focus only as much as we can in half an hour on the U.S. Vietnam War, what happened and why, and forgiveness. And Chuck, welcome again. It's good to see you and uh, our continuing discussion of Vietnam, uh, which affected my life as well because I was a college student in the 60s and uh, Vietnam was, was a major uh, current event in my life. But I'd like to talk about you. Um, first of all, where, where is Vietnam? Where, where and what is Vietnam? Can you tell me a little bit about it? Vietnam is just below China on the eastern coast of Asia on the Pacific Ocean, uh, it has a bunch of islands. It previously was very active in the Spratly Islands and others that China is now asserting control over and building military installations. The South China Sea, is that what you call it? Some call it the South China Sea, some, some call it the East Sea, depends yeah, on your yeah, orientation. Yeah, yeah, okay. And uh, so it's a country that kind of uh, sprawls down the coast. It does, it's mostly coastline. It's fairly thin country. A um, little bit like kind of a skinny peanut and has over 90 million people, which is almost double the population during the American war years. Uh, um, so it has one of the fastest growing economies in the world. How did you ever get there in the first place? Tell us uh, briefly how you, how you got there and went back and forth so many times. I was in my senior year of college in 1968. One of my good friends from Madison, Wisconsin, where I grew up, came up. And he said, Chuck, you got to join this group called International Voluntary Services, kind of an international peace corps. And I said, why? And he said, because it's draft exempt. And those were my two <laughs> magic words. Okay. Yeah, that's, that is instant gratification what, what, for a 1968. What year was this? Yeah, 1968. So that was the, the height of the Vietnam it, War. It was literally right around the lunar offensive that he came up and we talked about that. So okay. I applied for Laos, a bunch of the volunteers quit in protest of US policy and I wound up going to Vietnam, which is... So by chance, you didn't, you by, didn't choose it? By chance, the best thing that's ever happened to me. And I'll apologize in advance, there are gonna be times when I get a little choked up. Um, it's become my second home, I have family, I have friends, I have people who are at the very center of my life and my heart. Okay, how, how did you, how, you know, when, when you went there, what, what, what was it like? The war, you were doing volunteer type, type services, was this teaching or? Yeah, I started off like a lot of Peace Corps type people teaching English. Some other friends were starting to work with homeless street kids and I got into some of that as well. Um, I worked some with uh, Army Civil Affairs doing projects, building volleyball and badminton courts and So sports. with the military? A little bit to on the degree. civil affairs side, okay. yeah. Tried to stay completely away from the military end of things. You could not, I mean, you could right. run, but you couldn't hide. If I went out to the countryside on the weekends, I'd be going up on my motorcycle and I'd see the rolling huge balls of orange flame eating up the forests where, and the countryside. Where, where was this? This was in central Vietnam. The city is Quy Nhan, which then was 100 and something thousand, now is in the millions. Uh, it's building resorts and doing all those things that bring tourism 
which would be welcome in Vietnam because it's one of the most hospitable countries in the world, has great food, has great people, has great places to visit and things to do and see. Okay, so, and, and how close was this to Saigon? Was it, uh, or how close to the 17th parallel, which is what, what divided the country uh, post-war? Uh, almost midway. Okay. In between. Okay. So. And on the coast, or? Uh, it was right on the coast. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and so there were American soldiers there, and. Uh, there were. And, um, and there was fighting going on nearby. There was fighting very nearby. I've run into a number of people who were stationed at Phuket, out in Binh Dinh Province, and uh, I would go out to An Khe in the countryside on the weekends. We were developing Boy Scout and Girl Scout troops. We were working with the farmers, with the Vietnamese Voluntary Service, kind of like our VISTA over here. And that helped me develop both rural and urban relationships and experiences. Okay, and, and the group that, that you were with, it was, it was like a civilian uh, core. What, what was it that, that was doing uh, good, good things for the, for the, uh, the local folks? Well, we were trying to. I mean, we were basically listening, paying attention. We didn't come with any answers. We basically came with one question, which is, how can we help you? Okay. So, so, and and you didn't know anything about Vietnam before you I were... didn't know the language, the culture, nothing. Okay. And so you, you, you landed in, in Vietnam. There was a war going on. Uh, you, you did this volunteer work, draft exempt. Okay, I, I, I understand that very well. Uh, now, what was your understanding of why we had U.S. troops in Vietnam? What, what was the historical understanding that, that you had at the time and maybe have now? It's a great question because those are two very, very different things. I knew very little at the time. I knew what the media disseminated, which was essentially the military uh, and political line on that, which is we were there to fight the evil threat of commun communism, which is a long way from what it was really going on there. So there, there was the, uh, the domino theory that if... if well, for uh, Eisenhower, it was the domino <laughs> theory. It was interesting because as the president who most understood war pros, cons, he was the one who absolutely would not commit militarily to mm. supporting the French. That didn't happen actually until Kennedy, Nixon, and others later on, and Johnson. Um, but we poured probably over two and a half billion dollars into support of the French war colonization in Vietnam. So at, at this was and we didn't post learn from that mistake either. Yeah, yeah we didn't learn. Yeah, we. So this was post World War II. Correct. And Eisenhower was the president, and there was a fear. I mean, they, they, China had just gone communist, if you will. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Communist Party had just pre prevailed, and uh, uh, what, what was ruling in, in the mainland China, and there was some fear. Is that it in America that? Uh, the rest of Asia would go communist, and somehow that would be um, uh, very bad for the United States. Is that is that what it was? Or? I think that's a fair statement of of what the rationale, the justification that was offered was. Um, it, there was a serious misconception that communism was monolithic that Russian communism and Chinese communism had anything to do with each other, which they didn't. And in fact, they were fairly antithetical. Um, the Chinese would no more accept Russian domination right. than the Russians would Chinese. The Vietnamese had had extensive experience with the Chinese because the Chinese had occupied Vietnam for over a thousand years, up until the 10th century. And uh, Vietnam actually sort of culturally convinced them to leave, although they did win a military battle on the Bac Dang River that was given credit for helping to convince the Chinese to leave, but it, it took a thousand years. Um, with the French, it only took 100. With the Americans, it only took 20. With the Russians, it took almost another 20. Okay, so... But so, they're good at that. So 
the reason at that time, and that's what I learned when I was in college too, is to, to fight, fight communism. We had mm -hmm. to stop communism from uh, taking over Asia. Uh, is that, I mean, is that still the, in your mind, the real justification or have you, has anything changed? I mean, to me, I, I haven't heard, I, you know, I haven't heard anything else, but is, is, is there any other, any other reason in your mind now after going back and forth and obviously a great part of your life is focused on this area? Any other thoughts about this? Is hey, there's a, the response to that, I think, <clears throat> Colonel Sherman Potter on MASH has a word that he uses when a theory that has absolutely no justification in reality at all. Horse pucky. <laughs> it's a good word. Um, it, it is one of the grossest misconceptions of both communism and of international relations politically and economically ever. And it unfortunately convinced Eisenhower against his better judgment to commit monetarily. That monetary commitment and relationship, although de Gaulle, after the French lost at Dien Bien Phu in 1954, in a speech in Cambodia, warned the Americans, get out, don't make that mistake again. You know, it took us 100 years to learn, don't go there. Um, unfortunately, Kennedy and after him, Johnson, were convinced by the what John Kenneth Galbraith, probably our most brilliant economist maybe ever, called the military-industrial complex, which rose to power then and has now risen to power again. Uh, people are not getting, because of all the stuff that's on the surface of the froth about the politics now, that behind this, underneath this, why we export war, why we live by war economically, is that the military-industrial complex still dominates the decision-making. And I think it was Eisenhower, perhaps, who warned against that. He did. And, and so he, he was not, uh, he was aware of, of what was going on. He was not a fan. But he was also, perhaps, s sincere in his concern for communism, uh, whatever that thought pattern was in those days. Uh, and and so it, it wasn't a a, a totally a, about money for him. It was also about a, a philosophy or a, a way of, a way of life that he that he also objected to or felt was not a proper. Yeah, and it's interesting because he, in the U.S. doing that and taking the monolithic red scare red threat philosophy that McCarthy had made so much out of in his time. They actually provoked a serious escalation in the Cold War. The Berlin Wall actually came to be because of that U.S. stance on the Big Red Scare and the anti-communism political stance as the core of the U.S. foreign policy. So instead of mediating and arbitrating we decided to fight at, at it's some what we point do. along the line. Uh, and, and how did that come? How did that happen? How did we decide to go from, well, we, we paid some money to the French, I guess, uh, to help them fight. How did it go that we started to put American lives into the battle? That's a great question. Because we had reportedly only dozens of military advisors in there. 50s even into the early 60s, and it went up really quickly. One of the things that was used as an excuse was that there was an intelligence operation which sent an American intelligence destroyer into the territorial waters of North Vietnam without clearing it first. A and some warning shots were fired. Just say, hey, this is our territorial waters. Get out of here. From, and so from, they from left. The north, the and north. that was used as an excuse with Johnson to escalate the number of troops from the hundreds up into the hundreds of thousands. Kennedy took it to about 100,000, Johnson took it up over, over 250,000. We eventually got up during Johnson's time over 500,000 American troops, 60,000 of which were killed, 250, 350,000 were seriously injured. The number of PTSD cases which were fought up until maybe five years ago and are now being acknowledged were in the hundreds of thousands. It just... 
and 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 how many had a horrible been? consequence on the life, the mind, the spirit of the American people, including those that did service in Vietnam, who deserve our respect, our understanding, and our support. And, and how many Vietnamese were killed? Is there any, any number? That Upward of two million. I think that's probably conservative. Um, I lost students, I lost family members, I lost fellow volunteers. Well, you know, just being in the wrong place at the wrong time. For, for what I hear from you also is that uh, we, as a country, maybe we've relied on war a little too much, and this is a lesson that we should pay attention to today. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that after our break. Okay? That's a really good place to leave it and to go from. Thank you for watching Think Tech. I'm Grace Chang, the new host for Global Connections. You can find me here live every Thursday at 1 p.m. where we'll be talking to people around the islands or visiting the islands who are connected in various aspects of global affairs. So please tune in and aloha and thanks for watching. Good afternoon, Howard Wig, Code Green, ThinkTechHawaii.com. I appear on Mondays at 3 o'clock, and my gig is energy efficiency, doing more with less. It's the most cost-effective way that we in Hawaii are going to achieve 100% clean energy by the year 2045. I look forward to being with you. Aloha. Looking to energize your Friday afternoon? Tune in to Stand the Energy Man at 12 noon. Aloha Friday here on Big Tech Hoi. And we're going in a much direction, worse direction. We, now. We, are, we are back and we are talking about Vietnam. We are talking about what happened, uh, well, let's say 50 years ago plus and, and coming forward and where America and Vietnam, well, where, where there was a war in Vietnam with Americans and uh, uh, about 60,000 died. And the question is, uh, what have we learned from that? What have we learned? Or what, let, let me, before we talk about now or the present, what do people think about the Vietnam War now? Is it? Is there, I mean, what are your impressions? I mean, obviously you can't tell me what everybody thinks, or, uh, but what, what is your impression as someone that is, is, you know, involved with Vietnam and knows it, knows its people and its history? What are your impressions about what Americans and Vietnam, Vietnamese think about what happened at that time in the 60s? That's, that's a great question because where it goes to is, it became really, really clear to me and increasingly clear as I learned the Vietnamese language, which is wonderful, it's rich and it's full and it's precise, that the people in Vietnam, huge majority, I mean, we're talking 90 plus percent probably, did not want the war, did not believe in it, did not believe that it was going to be effective. All they wanted to do was to find ways to survive it and to minimize its impact on them and their families and their communities. And that became increasingly hard to do as we escalated from a few troops up to 100,000 to 250 to 500,000 plus. We essentially took over the military part of the war and in doing that should have realized because there was no will, there was no support in the Vietnamese people for that war. It was an American war. We export it. It's what we do. And we do it because the military industrial complex and a political leadership that's responsive to it and funded by it believes that that competitive adversarial combative strategy is the one that's going to achieve the most success because some of them personally have achieved their positions and their power by very combative adversarial approaches to people and life. So it's a, uh, giving a business uh, philosophy to, to politics is what I hear you saying, is that this is how you win. Is that right? That's, that was the philosophy. Kennedy bought it. Um, Eisenhower had kind of grudgingly conceded to supporting it financially and a little bit militarily. 
But Johnson, who had initially resisted it, was probably the, the shrewdest and sagest and most experienced of the politicians and saw why that was a really bad strategy. Later got convinced that if we don't, we're going to lose or look really bad in the eyes of the world. And that face factor became dominant in U.S. policy. And that tells you that decisions are coming out of ego, power, and competitiveness rather than out of bridge building and relationship building. And that, and that would have been the way to, to resolve the problem instead of war, is what I hear you saying. And the irony is it's what Ho Chi Minh always offered. He lived in the States. He lived in France. He incorporated the U.S. Declaration of Independence into Vietnam's. He was a true believer, and his strategy was, ideally, to play Russia off against China, to work with the U.S. once they could bring an end to the military conflict, and to build the country in collaboration with the U.S. and France and the West. He never wanted long-term alliance with either Russia or China. It was forced upon them because at the end of the military conflict in 1975, Kissinger, with Nixon's blessing, sent McNamara to every major financial international institution in every embassy and country in the world to boycott Vietnam. No humanitarian aid, no military, no nothing. They were left with either Russia or China, so they picked Russia because they knew China and they were not going to go there. Russia tried for years to exert political control through military aid. Vietnam basically said, we don't want that stuff. The people in my family that were teachers quit because they were not going to teach Russian propaganda in the light of their history and culture in which not only men but women heroes had overcome by resistance. And resistance is the theme for Vietnam, and that we should learn from now. <laughs> and I remember things like carpet bombing and Agent Orange and that type of thing that we, that the United States uh, used, I guess, as a strategic tool to win, to win the war, which apparently di didn't do that job. But uh, what, what, what was that about? Uh, two things. Um, number one, it's the perfect example of sheer dominance of power by the military industrial complex, and I hate to use that buzzword again, but uh, Monsanto and Dow had a dump pile of chemical warfare, which was Agent Orange composed of three dioxins, which nobody wanted because the long-term effects are so toxic and so long-lasting. It has a multi-hundred-year carbon life. It bonds with soil particles. It gets in the soil. It gets in the air. It gets in the water. You can't get it out. There are ways to biodegrade it, and I'm now working with a project in Vietnam and Cambodia to do that over the course of decades with a microbial solution made from microorganisms and plants and other things that will break down that dioxin combination. But it was called a defoliant in order to defoliate the areas where the troop movement was. Number one, it's not a defoliant. It was chemical warfare. More of that was used on Vietnam than all other countries in all the other wars combined. And there was no excuse or reason for it other than Monsanto and Dow needed to dump it. They got the military to go along with it. They gave it as a rationalization. If we can defoliate the troop trails, the Ho Chi Minh trails, we can see where they're going and we can stop them. What a crock. They were in tunnels. Has nobody heard of the Kuchi tunnels? So, so this was a strategic move, uh, and uh, we've talked about the number of deaths. Okay, we've talked about 60,000 Americans, young men mostly, I would think, and about two yeah. million, two million uh, Vietnamese folks. And we've seen the pictures of uh, the My Lai massacre and that type of thing on on uh, uh, TV. Uh, but I. Th now kind of sense, and I want to talk about the last part of what we meant to talk about, and that is forgiveness. I, I, I kind of sense that with my friends in Vietnam and my American friends who've been to Vietnam, that there is, there is a deep desire on their own side to forgive and and maybe forget, or not forget, but to forgive. Well, what is, is my right? Is that a, is it, exactly. what, what's going on there? Number one, it's part of the culture, character, spirit of Vietnam. It's who they are. 
they identify people, they connect with people, they bond with people as people. They can separate and distinguish those things that are products of government and military decision making and actions. And they do not hold the people responsible for that. They can still bond. They are the most hospitable people you'll ever meet. You should go there, a friend who was stationed in Quinyang for years in the military, went back. He went up to Quinyang. He was received by his former adversary, communist adversary, treated him like royalty, took him around. This is the Vietnamese? Wind, uh, yeah, Vietnamese ranking military officer gave him the best time anybody could ever wish to have in Vietnam. He came back, he literally cried because it was so moving. Mm -hmm. And it helped him to understand mm -hmm. what we missed and why we were so wrong. We were offered the opportunity, we were invited to have the opportunity to connect with these people and their leader, Ho Chi Minh, who is called Uncle Ho by almost all Vietnamese. Even yeah. the ones who don't like him call him <laughs> Uncle Ho. Now, the other thing I saw is that, is that John Kerry, interestingly enough, I mean, he's, uh, his background, he, I mean, he served in Vietnam, uh, and then uh, one of his last trips uh, as, as Secretary of State, I mean, t to me it's very telling, he goes to Vietnam. Uh, look what, at, what, what was that about? What, look at our leaders. The potential for learning is exemplified by people like Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, and John Kerry. At the end of their tenure, every one of those three went to Vietnam almost last among their foreign visits. I know because a friend of mine who's with the Foreign Service in Vietnam organized Clinton's reception and spoke very highly of the way that he connected very personally, very openly, very warmly with the people, as Obama has, so it's as kind of, Kerry did. And it's kind of, so, so, so what I have hear, the other model. And it's, and it's asking for forgiveness as well as forgiving, both at the same time, is that? It's, it's actually, asking to be forgiven for not appreciating the offered connection, the friendship, the equality, the understanding, the respect, the cultural exchange, the bonding, the educational exchanges that have been happening for decades. If you talk to students from Vietnam who've been here or students from here who've been to Vietnam, their experiences are rich and wonderful because they don't have those preconcepts. There's nothing adversarial there's nothing competitive they are connecting with people with people, with people. okay and the stories of vietnam will do that thank you chuck i appreciate talking with you again about vietnam and i kind of think we're going to be back again sometime would love to <laughs> there will be more <laughs> thank you.